I am unashamed. What about you? All right, so we're excited today. We are, I don't know if this is the last time we had you on the podcast, Will. It's, it's been, been a minute. It has been. Uh, well, I think somebody, we, somebody said the last time you were here, you never said anything. Yeah, well, with this group of people, it's hard to get a word in edgewise. <laughs> well, we're going to make sure you get plenty of words in today, Willie. By the way, Dan, so Willie is freshly minted 50 years old uh, a few Are weeks you ago. 50? Yeah. I'm 50. 50. So you have, so three, your three sons at the table are now all over 50 years old. How does that make you feel today? Old. <laughs> Durr. Older. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. But I'm glad you're though your fifties at relatively a short period of time because if I'm lucky, I I'll just be passing from the seventies, <clears throat> early eighties, y'all will be in your sixties. Oh, I will be for sure. Yeah. It'll take it'll take Willie a decade. Yep. Why do we have to have this conversation every other week about well, because that's what, when you get old, that's the kind of oh, stuff no, you start yeah. talking about. Okay. Before we started rolling, we were talking about digestion issues and everything else. That's that ha- There has been a change at 50 in just the way bodily functions occur. Oh, yeah. 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 There's more surprises. Does that get better, Dad, when you hit the 70? Just, just, a, little, just a little thought <laughs> that I've Uh-oh. noticed. You, you want to, going into your 60s, you want to try to stay as thin as you can. You don't want to get globby. <laughs> you know, I don't know globby. what the world's wrong with me because I got up this morning. If your belly, I wonder if, you're, ta- I wonder if you can't tell about. where you're taking a leak, if you can't see where that's going, you need to you need to slack off and get the belly. Well, if you can't see where it's going, you, you may have other problems. So. <laughs> or your feet that let you know where it's going. <laughs> oh, man. Well, I apologize. Let's just your let's feet. <laughs> I will say I'm a young fifty, I guess, because my feet are not in the equation of which is good when I urinate. Yeah, so, so it was funny because uh, speaking of weight, so we had uh, Willie's roast for his fiftieth. Corey planned a roast, and uh, some of we were friends from around the country, and I got to roast you as well. And uh, but weight was the big. It was funny because Willie's, you know, he's he's gotten thinner. I've gotten bigger, but uh, still, your old friends were trying. It was almost like it was a retro. We were going right. to go back, you know, because they kept talking about your weight. You know, it's the only one didn't say anything about your weight was me because I <laughs> I couldn't be a hypocrite. But they even roasted me while they were roasting Willie about being fat. But it, that was a lot of fun. Did you like it? I never. That got was the you. funnest thing ever. When so Corey was trying to keep it a secret and. I didn't know about the ride, found out most of the other details. And then she said, we're doing a roast, which I'm so glad she told me. And so then I could be prepared. And I have, I mean, I laugh so hard. It's actually way, I'd way rather somebody roast me than say yeah. anything positive. I'd rather just be the roast and which I love roast. And so uh, it was hilarious. And then, so the whole time I was writing roasting material on the fly. I had some, uh, some some pre-done material, but uh, I think the funniest line I got was when I got up and said, I want to thank Phil and Kay for being here. <laughs> I realized they weren't here. I said, they're not out of town. <laughs> they're just at their house. Well, and, and then Jace wasn't there, and I'm like, he if literally, if he just walked out his door, he could hear what I'm saying. <laughs> That's right. And then I realized most of my family is not even and there Jeff for my there. 50th birthday. They're in West Monroe, but they weren't there. Which The was... question came up. Y'all may be able to answer it, but the question came up. Uh, they said, how can a family structure roast each other without anybody? Most people won't even try that. Yeah, They're not at a level where they will roast someone it, it it hurts people's feelings what level they said, is but y'all that? do that you do that with ease with ease oh, yeah. <laughs> so how does that work because you know the, the america's families are looking and said man i wouldn't i wouldn't put up with being roasted but but with us it's all a big laugh you know in this case the diarrhea she said oh you know i got diarrhea i can't go to the roast <laughs> I'm like, because, you know, if you're in that predicament, I'm like, yeah, you better stay away from the roast. 
Well, and it was funny because Willie had done a bunch of, he had a lot of really funny mom jokes, which you just did them anyway once you got into it because she wasn't even there. She wasn't there Once anyway, you established, so you wasn't Then there. I can roast you even more when you're not there. <laughs> I don't right. even feel bad about it. I'm not even looking at you. And so then, yeah, then you, you got Jay's too. But yeah, we, I mean, Willie and I both loved it. Cause that's, so what's the key to the family structure that can roast each other and no one is mad? That was the question well, I've heard about 10, 15 times. I think it's because I mean I don't we you can speak to it with it but I think it's because we when it comes to each other we're we're pretty much unoffendable. I mean we just kind of grew up that way I guess I mean I don't know I mean it was just we you throw. People. Well, I think a major part of it is not taking yourself too seriously, yeah. which a Good lot point. of people I find take themselves way too seriously. Good point. And so, yeah, I think growing up uh, the way we did, uh, we just learned early on how to make fun of things especially even when it's us you know um uh to deal with the pain so you just had to to laugh about it that's right Uh, but there was a funny you know i think and Kay's funny you know she's super funny and always was and so yeah you just kind of get better and better at that and um yeah you just kind of develop that out but i I think it's just not dad would get tired of it remember when he would get tired of us joking he'd say all right saturday night live is over yeah saturday night live is over (laughs) Well, it wasn't the, it was the noise level. Yeah, he, you know, it was a small house again, so, uh, <laughs> which makes it funnier, right? I mean, that's what, you know, that was kind of like Doug Dynasty. It's what makes it funny is that, you know, it, when you're, if you're getting in trouble, that's, and then it really makes something. Yeah, it's funny. like, don't laugh. Don't laugh. Well, then you I can't, can't help but laugh. Right. Well, and laugh. I thought about it when we were at the, at the roast, I thought, you know, you and I, we've all worked together different you know, stages of our lives for church or duck commander. And we used to do what we, you and I were doing to each other and to your friends and our friends, we would do that to other people. And so we, we were tag team people. And I mean, it just, yeah. and everybody would, it would just turn into the biggest laugh right you ever had. I mean, it's just, but it, when you got out into the real world, I remember thinking, I was just kidding, and these people are crying. They're getting their feelings hurt. Or, like when I was at school, it doesn't always that, work, you know. Sometimes well, yeah, it, it doesn't work with people outside of your family. That's what I realized. So I, I, I kind of quit doing it. Right. I mean, and you, well, you know, I still, I still, I spoke a couple of weeks ago at this event at nine in the morning, Oof. and I went down right before, and they're doing a, um, it's a hour lecture on. Um, uh, logistics and moving like that in the business. Mm. And I'm just mm. listening to that thing. So I just immediately changed my first, uh, opening. <laughs> I got up in front of this crowd. It was their business. And, uh, I said, uh, well, I called my wife and I said, I no longer need any kind of sleeping aid. <laughs> I recorded the thing I just heard. That is the most boring thing. And if that doesn't, and they just laugh, you know, and it was right. their business right. and their, uh, their thing. But so you can, you got to kind of find a way to, to poke fun at it. Cause it was boring. And so no, but you, if you just call it out, you know, um, yeah, it's just a different way to look at it, and you can just laugh and then move on. That way, if someone else makes fun of you, you're like, hey, man. I'm yeah, I tried it one time when they, I spoke at the casino. And uh, Uh-oh. or a group of house this builders. This is a famous podcast. Story. Yeah, and they had a rap band behind me. I mean, really rappers. And and the whiskey was flowing. And they asked me to speak, and I just got up. And but once I started getting into Jesus, I've never seen a place get so quiet in all my born and days. Empty out so quick. <laughs> it was the party pooper of the of the this century. Case, that was the greatest party pooper I've ever seen right there. <laughs> I don't think it was a, it was for a business that was one of the, like, I was so hurt. He was when, doing spokes work for them. I was yeah. so hurt when they never called me back to speak again. <laughs> they, they didn't know what well, dad was going to do, but they should have known. I always think about when I go to speak, like Doug Dynasty was a, a, a funny show. Yeah. And so if I'm there, I want to, you know, I, 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 have, do the same I can thing. be funny. And so, uh, which is, you know, kind of difficult. So yeah, I find all kind of ways to, uh, one of my favorites was that I was going up, I was fixing to go speak and there was a projector with the sign while I'm in the backstage, I see the projector. So the guys up introducing me and then all of a sudden I just come up like a shadow <laughs> Falcon, like rising at, and it's me. And, but he doesn't know that I'm behind him over the entire screen. So and then I just start moving. <laughs> 
everybody's <laughs> laughing and he's doing the intro thinking like, man, I'm killing this intro. <laughs> and I'm behind him like a bird. Like, <laughs> and I got so tickled <laughs> what everybody was seeing. <laughs> the other thing that uh, really I had to really, t- uh, man, you talk about tone it down. I spoke at the, <laughs> let me get this right, the National Erectors Conference. Ooh. There's a group who build towers. Yeah. And so when it's erectors, anything that had to do with that word, I got <laughs> and just strategically made these jokes, which I'm sure they probably heard before, oh, but yeah. I, then I got tickled, then everybody laughed. And um, so, yeah, I just try to find some humor in wherever it is that I, I'm at. Well, well, and you have to because I, I think that has was the underlying success. And I have to give you credit for that, Will, because, you know, when, when the show first, the idea first came up, you know, we're all have a serious side. Obviously, we, you know, we lead people to Christ. But, I mean, the show was supposed to be fun, and it was. And it's really what built the platform for us to do what we do now on the serious side. So I think without a fun show, we would have never gotten the opportunities that we've done, you know, and all been able to do since then. Well, and laughter's podcast. important. I mean, look at, you know, look, look at where we're at now, the state of, you know, even comedy and late night shows. I mean, uh, it, no one can laugh anymore. It's just, mm. it's so serious. And so, and I think stuff. we need that laugh. Yeah. We need to be able to laugh. And I can't tell you how many people I run into speaking. They're like, Oh, I just wish y'all show would come back on, you know, just like, cause I haven't, I don't laugh anymore. Just what you just said. I hear we're it. Coming, over. We're back. I tell her, I said, well, look, there's a new one coming well, out. Willie, my, Willie, I don't, can I say that he came? Yeah, I guess so. I think you're on the <laughs> teaser. So you make a oh, surprise yeah, yeah. appearance. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he came and joined us for a few days of fun. An homage. Because I tell you, what's real comedy is uh, treasure hunting. <laughs> and there's nothing funnier than that. I've been mean, just walking around. <laughs> beep, 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 beep. <laughs> <laughs> this is what he did. People are going to think, oh, did they make this up? Willie laughed the whole time. Oh, they just laughed and laughed and laughed. Is there... well, they just walk around like yeah. these things. Like, oh, I love it. It's... <laughs> Nothing says national television more than that, does it, Will? And if you can't make fun of that, wow. <laughs> they actually said I was in one of those meetings. They're like, well, where's the comedy going to come out? I was like, we're. <laughs> We're walking around in a field looking for lost treasure. <laughs> They're like, no, nobody laughed. It's said, comedy gold, man. Said, That's I mean, funny. Literally. No, it was, I, I thought the episode I saw was really funny. So I was going to ask you, Will, so do you remember, because we just, Dad and I just went over and visited this, the movie set, which I know Corey has been, have you been as involved in that as she has? Because I know she was like a big part of the, what movie set are we talking about? We're talking about Dad's, the movie about oh. Dad and Mom. Did they ever finish? <laughs> and us. Yeah. And us. Right, right. Yeah, it's called The Blind. They they wrap production, I think, last they week. They just wrap production. I have been uh, very involved, but not as hands-on, mostly because Corey's so involved. And, uh, and, and then so Zach, I'm hearing a lot of the conversations. Right. I did go over to set, and um, I, when everyone came over, they came to our house, and uh uh, they came over. I think that's the first time Phil met uh, the guy playing him yeah. and Kay met who was playing her. And, um, yeah, it's really cool. And John Shepard, uh, my grandson, plays me, yeah. at too, which is uh, really surreal. Um, Somebody told me that Johnny played Alton. Johnny played Alton. Which was cool, which is his, Corey's grandpa. is her, So her yeah, dad. My father-in-law played yeah. her grandfather. Um and so, yeah, it was just a. Uh, so, the, yeah. so the people playing you, it was like a kid, like when we were. Yeah, well, he was yeah, little. It's, it's John Shepard. It's who played me. My, uh, There's an actor that plays some you. kid. I yeah. don't know. Well, his this lucky day. Yeah. yeah, he. Yeah, I saw the kid. It said Jason. Yeah. And then there's a little owl. He's a good looking. Owl. He's a little there's a young yeah. owl. Yeah. And then Phil good has several fellow. people. Yeah. Three different actors because he's got it's over time, and um, and so yeah, what a what a surreal. Because you really, you know, as you get older, you forget, you know, even what things look like. And then the cuts I've seen of the movie, it's just amazing. It's like you're back, you know, oh, really? 1968. Oh, it, it, yeah, it's like it was crazy. Incre- it was how, very incredible. You know, 
how it brings it back. When and is this, this movie coming out? Do we know that? I don't know. I don't think there's uh, been a release. Probably in the spring of next year. Or next year. Uh, okay. Yeah, that's yeah. It'll take a lot of editing. So all the principal photography is shot, and uh, yeah, it's their story. I think it's gonna be hard. It's you know, I, I teared up just watching like two minutes of it. Uh, You're getting so emotional in your older age. <laughs> No, but you just wait till you watch. You wait till this <laughs> one. Some it's of the some... and it's all. It's not Doug Dynasty. <laughs> it's not. You know. It's well, just. I the, hope not. It's just a hard. It's a. Yeah. It's a tough story. And uh, uh, and I'm actually working on a book. So the timing was just crazy because I go through and I'm talking about uh, some of those times. So it, it'll be. In, it was interesting writing right. for me writing about uh, and. My book's about preaching the gospel. Shocker. Uh, which I was listening to you earlier, when, and I, when I walked in, it was like, we're doing the same exact thing. <laughs> like, But I haven't been we here. Haven't like, we haven't been We <laughs> haven't seen you in a while. And so when it's amazing we? the mission that you're on. And then and then I hear this, and I'm like, oh, this is exactly we're what We're all kind of doing the same I'm thing. Talking about. <clears throat> Let's take a break. So who says I want to pay a couple of hundred bucks a month more for my new car or why don't you add a grand to my mortgage every month nobody says that right because everybody is trying to save a little bit of money especially on things that you have to borrow money for and that's one of our sponsors is a, a company called scoremaster uh, that they have what they call the three-week rule you give scoremaster three weeks before you apply for a mortgage buy a car or apply for a credit card or finance anything. And the reason they say you have a three week rule is that they can add points to your credit score in just three weeks. In fact, that they add on average 61 points uh, to a credit score. So that's gonna save you a ton of money, especially on a mortgage uh, or, or some big purchase that you have to have. So to optimize your credit score so you pay less interest, it's the best way to beat inflation, which everybody's worried about these days. So you go to scoremaster.com slash fill to raise your credit score and help get a lower interest. That's scoremaster.com slash fill. So, because uh, we talk about, the, you're one of our uh, other churches in town, one of our sister churches is what I call her. Um, you, you're working there. T tell our audience what kind of what you do. I mean, you're like, uh, sure, you're a volunteer, but we're all working for free now. Well, I was, <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to make it sound like you, <laughs> the church is paying you to do no, that. That is no, true. No, I'm, uh, yeah. We all work I'm putting in. in, I'm not taking out. Exactly. So, uh, that's where we are today. Uh, yeah. I w well, I was actually, I was just in Washington, D.C. Um, a couple of days ago at the, uh, the Bible Museum. I was with the, oh. the Green family and, yep. Which was again, I'm just blown away by how many people are out there. You know, you just, I think sometimes we get in these little bubbles and you forget, man. There's great people thought. just, yeah. You know, I was in that Bible museum. I actually was able to speak there, and I talked about that Bible museum being like I said, it felt like it was like John the Baptist. You know, it was like in this city where you just don't think about godly things coming out of Washington D.C. And here's this beautiful building that's you know that's just all Bible. And what they've and done so, is amazing. And so amazing, right? It's done it's so unbelievable. well. Unbelievable. Yeah, unbelievable what they've done. And just, you know, how they how they do that. So, um, but yeah, I was just there and I, I told them, you know, and the idea was warfare. And I said, I would consider myself a, um, you know, kind of like a, a Navy SEAL uh, gospel assassin. Uh, uh, <laughs> in a good way. In, in a good way. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, Cause I, cause I think, I think if, when you think of yourself, it's how you think of yourself and then, then you will say, Hey, that's where I want to be. And, and then you'll try to achieve, you know, where that's at. And so, but it's the idea of getting the gospel out and how do we get that gospel out? That's the book I'm working on, uh, right now because of some of the things that we're doing, because it, you know, the way the gospel gets out and Phil's story that it's amazing. And in my book, I, I really highlight uh, Bill Smith, you know, the guy who actually went there. Uh, who has a major role in the movie, by the way. It's Doesn't great, it? but yeah. just okay. to think, you know, I, I was just writing this out, and I was thinking about what it took uh, even to go there and pull that off. Because um, you guys were talking about country club uh, churches, but the, but it's a different idea. And I'm not even talking about the church, like what happens on a Sunday morning. I'm right. talking about getting the gospel out there right. and what that, and then... And then I talk about how I feel that legacy that was passed on. You know, the older I get, I'm thinking about what what will I pass on? What right. you know, and what I want to make sure my kids have, and I want to make sure that they have the gospel. They see it lived out, and they see the excitement of spreading that out. 
And so one of the things uh, locally, um, uh, which is important, you know, they kind of talk about, you know, like all politics is local, you know. And so really it's when you get down to what you're doing day in, day out. I know we all go speak and do things all over the country and all over the world. But, you know, that day in, day out. And one thing I wanted to do was was put together a, um, a, an intentional uh, ministry with evangelism. And so I was sitting a couple of years ago in a speech by Lee Strobel. I didn't even know who Lee Strobel was. He wrote oh, wow. Case for Christ. And at He's the amazing. time I had no idea. Yeah. The speech was called evangelism. And I thought, well, I'm into that. And so and it was at a conference. I spoke there as well. And I sat there and later I talked to Lee and he said, I didn't think you were paying attention because you had your head down. I said, I was taking notes. But he said, go back to your church, your local church, and just ask who's in charge of evangelism, like like as a ministry. And he said, just watch the response you get. And usually you'll get a guy going, well, I guess I guess the pastor. And so very few churches have a specific you know, thing. And we have ministries on youth, uh, college, on marriage, on, you know. Family. Family. I mean, all these different things. And But specifically on what, when Jesus left, said, make sure you go do this, a specific ministry. We usually don't have anything organized or intentional. And generally, there's some people in a congregation, uh, like everywhere, that, that, that are they're the ones who will right. go out and do that. And by evangelism, you mean sharing Jesus with people, just proclaiming in, in the, the gospel. That's right. Yeah. You know, just proclaiming the gospel and uh, especially that initial, you know, uh, sitting down. How and, they surrender to Jesus. Yeah. Right. So I went to my group and because I was new to this place, I didn't know. I thought maybe they have something. And um, so I went to some of the pastors. I said, hey, who's in charge of evangelism? And I got the same look. You know, it's like, well, um, <laughs> The uh, thing is, <laughs> so here's what's funny. It's a classic church. This reminds me of Al, oh, you know, yeah. the pastor. So about two months later, I get a call, and they said, and they said Will, are you, are you, I hear you're excited about evangelism. I said, I am. They said, you want to start the ministry? So they had <laughs> talked about it and said, well, yeah, we need something like that. And yeah. you're the one Since that opened you brought your mouth. It up. You're in charge. I said, I got it. And yep, so That's uh, my classic move. I've been doing that all my whole life. Now, it's been very interesting. Uh, it, it's, it's not... Like I, I'm evangelistic, but then teaching others how to do that has yeah. been just, you know, it's just been this yeah. whole new world. You know, how would that look? Where do you start? We had no books. We had no curriculum. And so I called Lee and uh, we talked through things because he's working on stuff in, in Colorado. There's actually a degree in evangelism. And so there's a lot of people working on on how to get this. And uh, and so we cranked it up. So I went to the pastors. I said, look, um, I was a little un like. The way things happen, you go to a church building, you sit there, you sing songs. You uh, most do. I don't feel does sometimes, and sometimes they don't. But uh, <laughs> Phil said nobody can sing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Said, hey, anybody got a song? Crank it up. No song? Fine, I'll preach. <laughs> <laughs> then you have a message, and then so where we go there's a like a response it's like hey if anybody wants to you know it's like uh, the altar call do is a response. The evangelism. and so people yeah. are like raising their hands and then you know and i was just i went to the pastors i said look i i bet some people raised a hand want to make a life change and they're out in the lobby and then they're saying hey where are we gonna go eat lunch you know let's go yeah, to right. captain d's you know and I so think that's a good assessment we like, talked about like, that do a lot. they know what like there's nothing else in life that you get into when i want to buy a vehicle i don't stick a hand up going hey i'm good you know and they're like, hey, we'll bring it right <laughs> yeah, over bring to that you. right over you know to when i when i get electricity at a, my house it, there's there's a long thing buy try buying a house and see what that's like or all these things even the commitment like to Corey, there was this, th you know, like, make sure, are you sure? And I think Luke 14 covers that for sure with Jesus saying, hey, make sure of what you're getting in on, mm -hmm. of counting the cost. So if there's any way we could, you know, where we could have an opportunity. So uh, I commandeered a room. And so our church had a program called Next Steps, which a lot of churches do, which is the next steps. And, you know, what's your spiritual gifts, small groups, kind of what the church is about. Connecting community, right. So our group, we started, we called our room the first step. So if you had any questions about, maybe if you raised your hand, if you didn't, if you bounced in there and just like, I have no idea. Uh, because I find that people with evangelism, one of their main things they do, which is not bad, it's just, I just don't think it's the best, is they invite someone to the very thing that they're doing and they're hoping yeah. that they'll sit there and go like, you get it? Yeah. But I'm convinced, it would be like saying, man, 
my insurance guy says, Willie, you've got to come to this big insurance conference. And I get there and they're, they're yah yah about insurance and rates and quotes. And I'm You're sitting like, there going, I need to what get are y'all insurance. talking about? <laughs> yeah. like, I, I have no idea. Yeah. And if you've ever sat there, just next time you sit there, think about the language that's used. And if you're not in on it, yeah. you have no idea what mm. what we're talking about. It's all about. inward. It's the redemptive work of the spirit that's living it. Yeah, you know, it's like, what in the world? And so if you pick up, you know, like if you just go in there and hear some sermon, because it's not, probably it feels it is, but most traditional churches, it's not just the gospel every week. You know, they're talking right. about giving or they're talking about serving or whatever it is. Some book or some book or something that old Testament. And so, so we have this room and it's, it's the funnest room in the place. And so people walk in there and the people at the front, if they come up and say, I've got questions, they just send them down to us. Right. And so we started training. Now this will shock you at this congregation. There was close to 2,500, 3,000 members. It's, it's a big place. I went to the some of the pastors. I said, who are the evangelists in this church? Like, who's fired up on sharing their faith? Because where we were, where, where you guys are, like, I knew, I know that yeah. there are four or five people. I know who they are. And so I said, well, let me think. You know how many names I got? One. <laughs> <laughs> one. I got one name. That's kind of embarrassing. It's very embarrassing. And... And that guy was in his 70s, is in his 70s, and he passes out these tracks yep. to people. The old tracks. And they were like, well, that's the guy that- Well, it's you know. something. And it's not that people weren't thinking about it. It's just that nobody was really known to go out and share that. They it's, really yeah. had this mentality is that most of it happens on Sunday morning. That's where it all happens. That's where the growth is. They do have some retreats and stuff where you do see some some transformation. But, you know, this, this idea of going out there and getting after it. Well, and, since I had one name, I, I said- well, we Started can definitely it. improve on this. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the for bar sure. Is low. Hang on, let's take another break. Well, so now we've got scores of people who have trained. I get them up in front of the group. Because you're gone a lot too. And they actually. Well, our, our group has. Now we have two rooms. Yeah. So, because what happened was we had the room where people would come in, they'd want to, you know, learn how to do a Bible study with someone. Well, we had a lot of people that were coming in to learn how to do that. And when you're sitting there watching, it's even better. Um, well, then we had so many people, it got a little uncomfortable for, you know, I'd have one guy in there trying to, you know, he's getting a Bible study. I've got 12 people sitting there looking. It almost looked like an intervention. So we split it. Now we have the discipleship wing of that, which is actually training, which Jace came over right. and did that. And I do that as well, as well as some others. And then we just keep that room. Sometimes people are in there. It's after every service. Yeah. And sometimes they show up. Sometimes they don't. If some And somebody's work in that room. The person in that room has been you know, has been trained to kind of know, you know, where that is. And it's really exciting. Now we just got people that every Sunday and we got these group texts. It's like, Hey, we had, I think two baptized, uh, just this week, uh, that came out of somebody came in that room. And so I've got, um, and I've got a whole system for that. And I've written all that out. It will be in this book as well on how we're doing that. And we're kind of just, we're learning as we go. Some things well, worked. And, some and I was things... sitting there thinking about when you were describing it, well, this, cause you know, we got, there are a lot of people that listen to this podcast, so obviously and most of you are probably engaged in a church somewhere, and you may have been feeling that same passion. So what a great thing. I, what a great thing to go to your church you're at and ask yeah. the same question you Unless asked. Your thrust, <clears throat> your thrust is we, we, we know what happens on Sunday morning when we all get together and how it's all structured, but you're basically training them on – who are you and what are you about on Monday mm -hmm. and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday before we report back in here? You're, right. you're showing them the lifestyle that's involved in all this as far as being the, you know, we've been talking about, you know, that we are ambassadors. Yeah. You mm -hmm. know, an ambassador, you know, he didn't have a, he didn't have a one day a week deal where Sunday morning he goes, an ambassador represents 24 the one who sent him. 24 7. Yep. Which, well, here's the deal. That's Phil. the power of it. Let me just blow your mind for a second. We're all sitting here talking mm -hmm. about the gospel, getting the gospel out. Mainly because of Phil and Kay and where that started. Right. Okay. Phil was not going to ever go into a building 
at the spot he was in in life. He wasn't going to go in a room. Right. Somebody's going to have to go to him. Which so the idea is we're training people there. This little Sunday morning thing, it's just one piece, but it's so small. It's really what happens on Thursday night, Friday night. Yep. Who are you sitting by yep. on an airplane? Yep. Who, who are you going to have to go get? When I said Navy Steel, that was that was what, what that was for. Because who can – Who's who has the wherewithal to be able to go into a bar and actually talk to someone? And that's exactly what happened. Well, if that doesn't happen, let me just tell you, none of this is here. Right. <laughs> like yeah. everything looks completely different. And so what I'm trying to get people to do, it's not s- trying to stop what you're doing. It's not, it's not that angle. It's not like, oh, you got to, it's what what can open up yeah. by somebody else when you share this and you watch their life just be transformed and then their children, their spouse, right. and then people that come under the people they work with. When you see that, then it's just like, how can we get this out even more? And it is amazing to me that somehow through church stuff, you know, all these years later, the majority of churches do not have anything intentionally focused on yeah. sharing their faith or, you know, exactly. how, how do you do that? Which by the say? way, then you see a culture begin to collapse. We were talking about this in the last podcast. That's exactly what happened. Because you're not United reaching States. the world for Jesus, you know? But I think when we were kids and, uh, you know, mom and dad, when people would come down, I remember you famously saying, I'm assuming they're lost if they're down here. <laughs> I mean, I think you meant logistically, but spiritually too. And so y'all would always share with them. So, you know, we got a, I got a taste of it there. But to me, you know, we did that when I first got married. You know, when I was in high school, just because it was so hard to live a Christian life in high school. When I And I've shared that story many times on podcasts. But, you know, I, I shared Jesus with this prank caller. Who was I don't know if it's a prank call. They called and didn't say anything. And the, the first person I shared with was someone who was on the other line of the phone who never said a word. I just I said, This is perfect. I want to share something with you. So I got into it. But the longer it went on, I thought, Well, what else could I have talked about where they would just sit here and listen? And so then I put them to the test and said, Call back tomorrow night. And I'll get some more material because that's all I got. I wasn't at 16 years old. <laughs> they called back the next night. And I and it just but they uh, never spoke to you. They never said anything. There was one whimper of a cry at the end of night two. Because by this time I'd turned into a full blown preacher because they weren't saying anything. Yeah. And I was like, you know, what's your problem? I mean, you can you can do this. But and they had the uh, the the capability yeah, to hang up at any Shut time. Down and then eventually time. they did hang up, but it was quite a few hours. That reminds of, of me listening. of what Willie was talking about, people who but, came through. <clears throat> I've had a substantial number that have shown up and what they say is, You do you remember me? And I'm like I said, Well, I said, you know, your face kind of looks familiar. He said <laughs> In other words, I was, no. When I was eighteen years old, I'm right now I'm forty three. But when yeah. I was 18 or 17 or whatever, I came by your house about some duck calls or whatever, and you you preached the gospel to me, and I was kind of offended by it. You know, and I left thinking, you know, that old coot. He said, but I didn't forget what I heard. And All right. I'm here to tell you that I've embraced Jesus. I've come because of the gospel. So everyone that does that, never forgot it. it makes you think. You say sometimes you think, you know, you know that old guy didn't seem like he was too fired up. Yeah, twenty years later, he did get fired up, but it was basically he went back to that day. So they come by for something real simple. Thank you. Well, that's what I was going to say. I was when I got. Hang on, Jace. Let's take a break. When I got to high school, I shared Jesus with all my friends. Well, none of them responded until later. It's like when I graduated, they all started calling in through the years. And, yep. But what I was going to say, so we, that, that was where I learned. But I think the just reading the Gospels over and over, I realized that kind of what Willie's talking about is Jesus, his whole ministry and lifestyle while he was on the earth was just filled with daily conversations. Some were religious people, some with not religious people, but it was these daily conversations. So now, I mean, I've shifted, shifted. I mean, I go out and share Jesus with, to big crowds all the time and basically give what I gave the the discipleship class because I'm trying to share Jesus with people who I'm thinking have never considered him. 
So there's a little bit of things to get their attention and questions. I ask those questions, you know, for all humans. How'd you get here? What are you doing here? And how are you leaving? I mean, those are good, interesting questions to just human beings in general and have a conversation. But in the last few years, predominantly, most of the conversations I have are in the grocery store or Walgreens or because if you look for the opportunities, it's amazing how there just always seems to be an opportunity to get into a spiritual conversation. Yep. I mean, and it, next thing you know, it's full blown sharing Jesus without a Bible, but it's just, well, that's what we, tr- so we train in different ways. Well, I'll have somebody get up with their Bible and they'll start going through it. Then I'll just get up and I'll grab their Bible and I'll say, finish it out without the Bible. It's amazing. Yeah, that's a good idea. It's amazing to look on their face because yeah. they, I'm Panic. like, because that's the way life is. It's never the same. It's never, yes, exactly. you know, I preach the gospel tons of times without a Bible. It just has to, you know, like Book of Eli, like the movie, like it's all here. <laughs> right. yeah. And it just comes out. That is a good movie. And so Jesus said, uh, so we look at like, like what's interesting, like Zacchaeus, what happened? Jesus invited himself over mm-hmm. to his house. So he was proactive, went over there. That's right. And by the way, that was the tell. Jesus let you know right there what he was here for. I came to seek and save what was lost. That's what I'm doing here. And then we see this guy transform his life and we see we see life change. And there when but it can happen in different ways. I think what's happened is in the church we we one we just ask the wrong questions. So the main yeah. question we ask people is what? Do you, you go to, come church? to church? Yeah. yeah. Or do you go to church? Yeah. Yeah. Now, I don't know if we're hoping the answer is no, and then we're like, oh, good. This is actually an impossibility. It doesn't make sense from the start <laughs> yeah. that you don't go to some church. <clears throat> yeah. But how, how many of us ask people, do you go to church? Well, then if the answer is yes, what do we say? Oh, that's awesome. But then there's an assumption Just that you they're go, totally where they are with the they Lord. Know Jesus. You know how many people I've asked where they go to church, and they say, yeah, and you know what they, they say, the church I go to. <laughs> and then I go, well, that's I've weird. Never, I've never seen you there. It's, like, it's which, happened to which me which many times. You go to, yeah. And then, then they go, ah. Uh, yeah, it's been a while, you know, it has been a while since I've actually, it's, it's a terrible question to ask. So, and so, but we do got to ask questions. Think about the eunuch, think about the Ethiopian. So the Holy Spirit tells Philip, go to this thing. When, when he goes to the chariot, the dude is, he had just left worship and now he's reading the book of Isaiah. Well, in my book, guys, that's a fired up believer. Yeah. You just left church and now you're stoplight reading your Bible. I'm like, boy, that cat's fired up. Yeah. <laughs> Had it been me, I may would have thought, I guess the Holy He's Spirit good. missed on this one. Like, my bad. You know, it must have been a different chariot. But then he asked him a question. Do you understand what you're reading? And right there he says, how can I unless someone explains it to me? And then back. So. There's a lot of people, I think, sitting at church buildings, they have no idea why they're even there. Or they're I there agree. for the wrong reasons, or they're there because it's a, you know, and it's it's not bad that you're sitting there, but they have no idea what it is. Then he preached him the good news. Well, it news. says that verse, it says from that verse, he taught him about from that the, very verse. From that, yeah, he, but he started uh, right there. To your point, he recognized the opportunity in that moment to say, Here's some good news about Jesus. There's the eunuch said, who's Isaiah talking about? Yeah. Himself, himself or someone, or someone else? else? That's a good question. Isaiah 53. Hey, here's another thing we train on. That's why you got to know the word. Yeah. What yeah. if Philip would have said, oh, shoot, Isaiah. I mean, mm. what what is he talking about there? And, <laughs> and so those he, songs, he started right there yeah. and did it. I noticed that. Who's all- that guy that Martin runs around with, with that you duck hunts with him? Clay McConnell. Clay. Clay, Clay great brother. And. I just met him on an airplane one time. We were seated side by side coming back to Monroe, coming to Monroe from somewhere. And I, I started asking him this question and that, you know, about to be the life and all that. And I started sharing with him Jesus, telling him about Jesus and all that. He was listening. But about halfway through it, he said, let me remind you of something. He said, I just got out of the Methodist seminary. He said, <laughs> he said I just graduated. I, I'm thoroughly, you know, <laughs> taught it first all. yeah I said, well great i said well it's right up your alley so i i just went on with the god told about this. <laughs> what about about a decade later <laughs> 10 years goes by and i looked out in the audience one time and it's on a wednesday night and i saw him sitting there i thought hmm. so i went over there and i said hey man how's it going he said i hadn't seen you since the airplane ride and he came back the next time well after about three or four days he said 
here I am with all these scriptures, you know, coming out of the seminary. He said, I missed, missed Jesus. It. I missed it, Phil. Yeah. He said, I missed it. So I baptized him. Now he's as good a faithful brother as you ever want. But it was yeah. about a 10 to, what I'm saying is we have to be patient. The power is in the message. So once we have that from our lips into their ears, let God work with them. Yeah. And I've seen a lot of them, you know, like him. But a great brother, he just, you know, just called him at the right time, whatever, you know. God loves him. I know that. I just Thank actually, you. I just had lunch with uh, with Clay. Uh, we were out at uh, Camp Chioka, mm -hmm. and so camp is a special place. That's where I met my wife. That's where my wife's parents met. It's actually where I worked before I came to work for Duck Commander. Was at this church camp, and John Luke's out there now. My son's out there uh, working. And it's there. also let's take our last break. Also, it the camp was first started by Corey's grandfather. Yes. In the six late sixties. Late sixties. And now it's two thousand twenty two and then his great grandson is running things out there. Well, that went to a height I never even thought was possible. Sixty years. I mean yeah. it actually they sold it, it got away from it at one time. It's and had we, a we interesting history, it. but it, it's, it's amazing. I left uh I was mowing. I was mowing the fields. That was my job. I was the used to live out there, and director. Right? I lived there. John Luke was. Was that in there. order to woo your wife? You later on, who was a well, Howard? That's another story. No, that's a, no, that's a, <laughs> you know. No, not, I was actually not working. many stories. The yard man ends up married to the, to the <laughs> boss that owns the field. I was field the yard you... guy, but I was mowing that field, and I thought I was trying to raise money for the camp, and that's where I had the thought. I've got. I think I've got to leave this place to help this place. I'm gonna have to leave it. Cause I think I can actually go do some things to help, you know, but I won't be able to stay. I can't stay here. And Bigger like than just and, taking care yeah. of it physically. And that's when yeah. I came down, you know, came down here. Actually in my book that I'm writing, I, I made this connection too. What's amazing is when that field conversion and, and Bill Smith, Alton was the one who started the church who hired Bill, you know, yeah. I, it's amazing well, what I did like, and then the way all these things crashed into each other later. Well, and Alton's uh, the reason that Jason and I went to school. Now yeah. the young people that are converted out there, but how many would you say? I mean, hundreds, thousands, oh, thousands. Well, through least the years. Thousands. Thousands. Yeah. Now it's, yeah, because now but almost you every weekend there's a different retreat. You can't put a number on it because it's really not only are you converting people, bringing them to Jesus. But then they go all over the world, and oh, so yeah. you don't know what how oh, that they become missionaries off. and everything. So, tell tell them so, about the sportsmen's camp. Yeah, I too. want to bring this up about our sportsmen's camp. So one thing we wanted to do out there was just dedicate a week to actually where we teach kids, uh, twelve to eighteen year old kids, boys and girls, uh, just about the outdoors and something we all the way we grew up and and what we what we learned. But we actually are having a sportsman's camp this year. It's June twenty sixth through July second. Uh, it is so fun. There, there's still some spots uh, open. If, Who's uh, the big guns you're bringing in to draw these people? Everybody. Well, I'm not. It, it's not I mean, we're all going to be there. You'll be there. They'll be there. <laughs> I'll set you up to say Uncle me. Si but will just, be there. Just kidding, do it. <laughs> we're doing dogs. We're doing. Uh, it's because you call yourself a big gun. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's our whole family. We kind of all put this on. And so we go out and. Literally teach things that are second nature to us, but it's so fun watching these kids. And you go to the Camp Chioka website to get you go to the Camp Chioka, yeah, yeah, C A O C A. Yeah, uh, yeah, well, like well, my deal. I've done put it. Put that up on the screen. I've done right. it for a few years, but you know, and I'll I'll do a duck call seminar because a lot of them want to know how do you blow a duck call and hunting. But you know, we share Jesus. Well, it's been saying like everything else we it, do. There were there's spiritual it's another component. Another great right. way to get Jesus in there. We can share you know, our faith with these kids and teach them right there. Uh, so it's just another way to do that. We have, we have summer camp, you know, that's, that's a Christian camp. Uh, well, my transition do that. from the duck call seminar to Jesus is I'll say who invented duck hunting? Of course, they're all just, you know, <laughs> they're like who did invent duck hunting? You know, I was like, God did Genesis nine. I go through that Genesis oh, yeah. nine, and I mean the look on their faces is. But it's a good transition, and I think it it's appealing to that that age group because it's a question they've never thought about, and then all of a sudden they read this in the Bible that they had no idea was in the Bible because mm -hmm. it kind of goes through why we eat what we eat, and 
I just think when you're looking for real practical ways to get people's attention for Jesus, especially have an outdoors thing, talk about something they love, duck hunting, ask them how it got started, then they're like, oh, that's in the Bible. Well, if that's true, and if Jesus is true, I mean, I next thing you know, they're like, well, why not? Yeah. I mean, I think it's I used clever. to see Dad do it for years on his speeches, but he used Acts 10. Same thing. He'd be duck call, blowing the duck calls, and everybody's loving it. And then he was like, a large sheet comes down out of heaven like a movie screen. <laughs> and yeah. then he goes right into yeah. the And just, guess what are birds of the air? <laughs> There's your duck. So oh, yeah. <laughs> Phil was a little more, he had the more intensity. <laughs> it was. Because he uses he used the riff about people saying, well, I can't believe you're eating a duck. Yeah. He used that as his motivation. He right. was like, hey, yeah. arise, I, kill, and eat. And then we got say, orders from headquarters. Yeah, <laughs> orders from headquarters, <laughs> Jack. <laughs> so that was always just the same type of approach, yeah. But yeah, yeah that's what we've been doing. This uh, program has been great. Jace has come over. Uh, I'll tell you about Shelly. We had this lady, Shelly. She came in, and if no one came in to sit and actually, you know, to have a Bible study, I would just teach and so and she would just come in she would just take notes i don't know who she was and uh she'd take notes take notes and so about three or four weeks went by and i said shelly could you ever see yourself getting up and teaching something like this walking people through and she was like no no <laughs> i'm just taking notes i'm i, I ain't that person i but i do want to learn and so i said well i tell you what i'll i don't want you just to stay there i want you to be able to where you can get up and actually walk somebody through this Easter Sunday, one year ago, uh, and a few weeks ago, uh, last year, I had to, I was going back over. I was doing something over uh, with you guys. They were honoring Corey's grandma. So I couldn't be there after one of the services. And we had like four on Easter. And I thought, well, it's probably, probably nobody's going to come into the class anyway. You know, it's Easter. Everybody's dressed up. They're not thinking yeah. about it. Although they should be thinking about it. That should be the day. Like, that should be the yeah. biggest day. <laughs> exactly. It's crazy to me. Um, <laughs> So it I is had to be away, and I yeah. said, "So I said, Shelly, I'm not gonna be here for the second one. Could you just, can you post up in here? Because I was having trouble finding people because everybody had Easter plans." And she said, "When I initially told her, she said I, I thought I was gonna throw up. I thought I was gonna have to just go literally throw up. That's how nervous <laughs> I was." <laughs> and then, so I, and she said she would do it, and so I go over. I'm coming back up to the building. I'm coming back for the third service. And I see the uh, well, the pastor, he's dragging my little my little rolling baptistry around. He's, he's dragging it out there, and he's got the water hose in it. I said, did somebody get baptized? He goes, yep, a guy and his son. I said, did they go to our class? He said, they went to your class. Wow. And I walked in, and I said, and Shelly's just bawling. I said, did you walk him through? She walked that dude and his son mm. on Easter Sunday, <clears throat> walked him through the gospel. Both of them got baptized that day. Yeah. And ever since that happened, she, it, you want to talk about on fire? Yeah. yeah, she has been so critical in this ministry, especially for women. Yeah. So because you know, if I have women come in, I just give them over to her. I say, Shelly, welcome. To, but just her confidence, well, uh, something she never thought she'd be able to do. Yeah. And she yeah. got that confidence. She knows the word. You know, she, she. I'm telling you, evangelism. It just it makes you get in the word because you have to study. Because just like we were talking about the the eunuch, if somebody throws a scripture out at you or, or some yeah. crazy idea that they've. It's just amazing what people brought, you know, grew up thinking like, well, I thought you had to, somebody told me the other day, I, I thought I had to walk down and, you know, officially at a building. I said, no, that's, none of that's in the Bible. And right. so you, you got to know the word. It keeps your life right because you, you know, you're talking to people constantly and uh, it's just, it's amazing. And that's one, but she's every week now. And so that's what we're doing, just training. And hopefully, you know, we'll have three or 400 people uh, that mm. will be intentional. And typically, if you're at 10%, that's kind of normal. But I'd like to see it. If you got hundreds of people out looking for opportunities trying to share their faith, there's no telling what would happen. That's right. Well, right. You know, I mean, it's not this yeah. just one pastor. Keep that you know, going there, Will. Keep it going, yeah. man. Well, and I want to encourage, again, the audience is right out of time um, to, to to have the same thought in your community because God's planted us in places to share and to grow the kingdom. And so we can do this. I mean, everything you describe. And look, I know you got the tools for it because you listen to this podcast. And so we, we're, we're all ambassadors. We're just asking you to do that. And no, it's your identity. We're 
We have the ministry of reconciliation. Yep, which God we just talked about. God and men. That's our job. So, uh, and, and the beauty of it, Will, is we get to do We're this We're ragged-looking ambassadors, but hey. If we get to, you know, between the Duck Call Room podcast, what Sadie's doing, what Christian's doing, what we're doing, I mean, we're reaching a lot of people, you know, in the, in this format, which is really awesome. All right, you know how, you know when a podcast has gone well? When it seemed like it, we just started, and we're out of time. So uh, we do have a little bit of overtime, because I've got like three other things on here I have that I need to ask Willie about that we didn't have time to get into. So we'll do that on overtime. Remember, if you want to cross over, uh, that's blaze tv.com slash unashamed. And we'll get a little more time with my little brother, Willie. Thanks for listening to the unashamed podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes and don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube and be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, subscribe to blaze tv at blaze tv.com slash unashamed.